Good evening, everyone, all you Chungyu lovers around this watered world of ours. Laszlo Montgomery here, as always, with a nice, meaningful Chinese saying to add to your ever-expanding collection. Fifty-eight of them already. Still tens of thousands to go yet. And in this episode, we're looking at Jia Tu Si Bi, a nice one lifted from the Han Shu, the Book of Han. Boy, does the Han Shu deliver or what? Quite a hefty repository of Cheng Yus from the Book of Han. Five already including this one that made it to the CESP so far. In this Chinese saying, I'm going to introduce a figure from ancient times who's making his first appearance on this show, namely Sima Xiangru. Now, don't confuse him with the Warring States legend from Zhao, Lin Xiangru, who we featured before in three past episodes, Wan Bi Gui Zhao, Fu Jing Qing Zui, and Jia Zhi Lian Cheng. So much did Sima Xiangru admire this great politician and general from Zhao, he took on his personal name, Xiang Ru. But before we go any further, let's quickly break down the four characters and see if we can guess what this one's all about. Jia Tu Si Bi. Jia is a home or your family. And the character Tu, when used as an adverb, means empty or bare. Si is a number four, and a B is a wall. Home Empty four walls. I think we can guess what this Chinese saying is used for. But then again, looks can be deceiving. So let's hear the story that comes to us from more than 21 centuries ago. From the Book of Han chapter entitled, The Biography of Sima Xiangru. Sima Xiangru lived during the 2nd century BC. He was a learned man from the city of Chengdu in Shu Prefecture, in the heart of Sichuan Province. He's revered as one of Chengdu's famous sons. By all accounts, Sima Xiangru was considered a child prodigy, as he was clever, studious, and a talented swordsman to boot. He was the whole package. And as the years passed, his genius only increased. He excelled at the most popular forms of Chinese literature in his day, namely a kind of poetry called Tsi and Fu. Tsi Fu. The Tsi form of poetry and the style of the great poets of 3rd and 4th century B.C. Chu state were wildly popular during the Han Dynasty. The Fu poems or rhapsodies were also greatly appreciated in their day. And Sima Xiangru, he is still generally considered the greatest writer of Tzu and Fu literature of all time. But Sima Xiangru, unlike a lot of great literati, came from a background of abject poverty. His one stroke of luck was that he was discovered by Wang Qi, the county magistrate of Lin Qiong, a neighboring county to the southwest of Chengdu. I spent a few days there once myself. Wang Ji became friends with Sima Xiangru and generously provided him with living quarters and treated him as an honored guest of the county government. Wang Ji also went to visit Sima Xiangru every day and further helped him, talking Sima Xiangru up in front of other powerful men, always praising his talent in front of them. There were two great tycoons of the Lin Qiong area who were named Zhuo Wang Sun and Cheng Zheng. When they heard that the county magistrate, Wang Ji, had a protege such as Sima Xiangru, a jewel of a man, they fell all over themselves to invite Sima Xiangru to their own banquets and events so that they could impress all their connections and business contacts. But Sima Xiangru repeatedly declined their invitations time and again. He accepted only when his friend, Magistrate Wang, implored him to make an appearance at Zhuo Wang Sun's upcoming banquet. At a soiree one night hosted by Zhuo Wang Sun, Sima Xiangru's flair for poetry, his wit, and his sparkling conversation dazzled all the host's important guests. Zhuo Wang Sun was extremely satisfied. All the trouble he had gone to to get Sima Xiangru to show up had been worth it. As the evening went on, Magistrate Wang asked Sima Xiangru to perform for them on the chin. And Sima Xiangru obliged. Of course, he played masterfully, and all the guests applauded and called for an encore. 
But before Sima Xiangru could begin, he heard the tinkling of jade bracelets from the direction of the women's quarters, and a beautiful girl's face could be seen peeking out from behind the screen that divided the women from the banquet guests. This girl was none other than Zhuo Wenjun, the daughter of the host, Zhuo Wangsun. She had been married off very young, but her husband had passed away, so... Following Confucian tradition, she had returned to her father's house to remain a chaste widow for the rest of her life, bringing her dowry back with her. Zhuo Wenjun herself was an accomplished and well-read woman, and moreover a true music lover. Sima Xiangru's playing had so entranced her that she had forgotten her place and strayed out of the women's quarters. What else can I tell you, except it was love at first sight for Sima Xiangru and Zhuo Wenjun. A flash of inspiration came to Sima Xiangru, and his fingers, which had been poised to begin another song, began strumming the chords of The Phoenix Seeks His Mate, Feng Chiu Huang. This was a song about a man confessing his love to a woman, and upon hearing this, Zhuo Wenjun understood Sima Xiangru's meaning immediately. In the spirit of true love, she knew she had to follow him wherever he went. Against her father's strong opposition and against all the societal taboos against a widow remarrying, Zhuo Wenjun eloped with Sima Xiangru back to his hometown of Chengdu. Zhuo Wenjun had been a rich man's daughter her whole life and never wanted for anything. When she entered the threshold of her new home, she had never seen anything like the conditions in which Sima Xiangru lived. His home contained barely more than four walls, Jia Tu Si Bi. Nevertheless, she had resolved to become Sima Xiangru's wife, for richer or for poorer, and in sickness and in health. And never once, in all the time they spent together, did she ever utter a word of complaint about living this rough. Instead, she and Sima Xiangru came up with a plan. Now, this whole matter of Zhuo Wenjun eloping with Sima Xiangru was a huge loss of face for her father. In his anger, he cut all ties with his daughter and refused to let her see a penny of her dowry. Not daunted at all, Zhuo Wenjun and Sima Xiangru moved back to Linqiong. Of course, this time they were no longer the honored guests of Magistrate Wang. His reputation took a hit, being the one who introduced Sima Xiangru and all. What these two lovers and soulmates did to sustain themselves was to open up a tavern right in the middle of town. Zhuo Wenjun herself was busy all day serving all manner of rough-and-tumble tavern guests instead of remaining behind a screen as befitted a rich man's daughter. And Sima Xiangru manned the counter and did all the accounts, at night, together, side by side, they cleaned and washed up the dirty dishes right in the middle of the street where everyone could see, and they felt not a lick of shame and cared not what anyone thought of the humble circumstances of their life. Anyone consumed with love and devotion to their one true love knew that nothing else mattered. If Zhuo Wangsun thought that having his widowed daughter remarry was shameful, he very nearly died of shame when she became an alewife on a busy thoroughfare in the middle of the town where he lived. Just to get rid of the blot on his reputation, he agreed to give his daughter her dowry on the condition that she never return to Linqiong. Zhuo Wenjun was more than happy with this arrangement, and she and Sima Xiangru returned to Chengdu, where they purchased a large plot of land and lived very comfortably from that point forward. Later on, no less a person than the great Han Emperor Wu noticed Sima Xiangru and invited him to his royal court, where he became an exalted figure there. In the end, Zhuo Wenjun was filled with joy that her gamble of defying her father paid off so well. The love story of Zhuo Wenjun and Sima Xiangru, with its elements of forbidden romance, defying outdated traditions, and outwitting a local fat cat, has become an extremely popular folktale, recurring again and again in operas, novels, and folk songs. And in the Chinese tradition, to describe someone who's extremely poor, one could say, Jia Tu Si Bi. His house contained only four walls, and people 
who would hear these words would recall the great love story of Zhuo Wenjun and Sima Xiangru, but would also know well, they didn't have much and could only afford to live in humble circumstances. Jia Tu Si Bi, a home containing only four walls, a Chengyu that describes a state of extreme poverty, like Sima Xiangru's humble abode. And like with many a Chengyu, you could also use this term when someone compliments your home. You could exhibit a nice dose of false modesty by retorting, Ah, Jia Tu Si Bi, playing down their compliment. So, we end on a high note. It's always nice to hear stories like this one. So much more pleasant than Chinese sayings that come from stories of deceit, war, or murder. I'll take a happy ending whenever I could get them. Jia Tu Si Bi, an empty home with nothing except four walls. You can use this one to describe yourself or anyone who's living rough and barely making ends meet. Jia Tu Si Bi, I hope no one can say this about themselves. And that is going to be it for this time. Once again, sending out a huge blast of thanks to Emma, pulling through once again, and as always, making everything so easy for me and keeping the house in order at the Chengyu Yanjiu Zhongxin. On behalf of the crew here, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, in the middle of a drought. I thank you for listening, and may I cordially invite each and every one of you to come back again next time for another refreshing and healthy Chengyu here at the Chinese Sayings Podcast.